I think we will get started now. Welcome uh, to uh, the either your second or fourth day, depending on when you arrived, of our ongoing conference. Pleased that you can join us this morning. This session is on risk and need assessments and really looking at the issue of addressing race, risk, and bias. My name is David DeMora. I'm the Director of Special Projects here at the CSG Justice Center, and I have the privilege of moderating this panel. And to my right are our guests, uh, and our, our esteemed guests, and I will start uh, on, on my far right and move toward me. Uh, Dr. Naz Nazgal Ganoush is a research analyst at the Sentencing Project. Uh, her areas of expertise include racial disparities in the criminal justice system, justice reform efforts, and public opinion about the criminal justice system as well as a focus on the issues of severe sentencing. Dr. Sarah Demeray, to her left, or your right as the case may be, uh, is a psychologist and professor at North Carolina State University. She's an established expert in risk assessment. She's conducted various evaluations of and assessments on risk assessment tools. In fact, you can find one of her uh, documents, one of her publications, on our website, co-authored with Dr. Jay Singh, which really looks at the majority of the risk tools used in the United States and does some comparisons and assessments of those tools. So we would encourage you to go toward that website and to take a look at that document. In addition, Dr. Demeray uh, is co-author of The Start, the Short-Term Assessment of Risk and Treatability. So please join me in welcoming our guests this morning. I'm going to take just a moment or two to mention a few issues from the perspective of the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and then I will turn it over to, to Dr. Ganoush, and from there, uh, Dr. Demeray will pick up. We will have some time at the end for questions. Uh, we will be playing that by ear as the, uh, as the hour goes by. So there are some things that we think are very important to think about when we think about risk assessment. And the first is that it is our perspective that the use of validated actuarial risk assessment really is necessary to more accurately determine differences in the likelihood of the risk of recidivism among those folks who do become involved in the criminal justice system. We don't want to go back to a time before where we guessed. Effective utilization of appropriately validated risk assessment, and there'll be some discussion of that, can help ameliorate unintended bias on the part of the assessor and of decision makers in the criminal justice system. Assessments do need to be validated on a local population and to take into account various issues and the population that exists there locally. Validation should include a number of things, including determining the degree of predictive ability that the tool has across race, gender, cultural differences, and the locale within the jurisdiction. And the validation process should specifically determine if there's any differential outcome when the tool is used across different races, ethnicities, and genders. There are a couple of things that we're certain of so far. What you're going to hear today is that we have a lot to learn. We know some of the problems. We know some of the things that we're dealing with. But we have a lot to learn still. But there are some things that we do know for sure. The first is that you do have to match appropriate treatment and supervision to the criminogenic needs that are determined by the assessment. You always have to do that to get a good outcome. And secondly, that the predictive validity and the utility of even the best risk assessments end up being limited if we don't follow them up with the appropriate treatment and supervision responses. If we still give everyone the one-size-fits-all response, no matter how good the tool we use, we don't end up with the outcomes that we are looking for. With that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Dr. Ganesh. Hi, everyone. It's a real honor to be here with you today and to have this opportunity to contribute to the important work that you're going to be undertaking. Um, well, I'm going to talk today about how to prevent risk assessment from turning into race assessment. And my talk is going to talk about these issues in relatively broad brush strokes, and Professor DeMarais is going to talk about them in much more detail afterwards. Um, risk assessment instruments are very powerful tools. Uh, because they can help to standardize and formalize decision-making. So we know that within the criminal justice system, 
most people have the best intentions, and yet good intentions are not enough to prevent implicit bias from affecting people's work. And what risk assessment instruments do is that they help to uh, make concrete and transparent how decision making is happening and help us to evaluate and assess which factors should be part of criminal justice decision making. On the other hand, we run the risk uh, by, by going through this process of solidifying uh, racial disparities that are unwarranted and variables that, that if we think a little bit more carefully about, we can adjust so that we're not producing, uh, reproducing disparities that would have happened with discretion instead through formalized decision making. So I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, viewpoints that um, that's been expressed about risk assessment instruments and what you'll see is that there's some disagreement about which variables are problematic uh, and so this is a complex issue and I want to work through some of these issues uh, with you. So I know most of the work that you're doing is focused on reentry, but just so that we have some starting point on racial disparities in the, in the justice system, I want to begin with talking about racial disparities in incarceration. So this is a, based on data from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, uh, estimating the lifetime likelihood of incarceration for someone born in 2001. So this is people, these are people that are teenagers now, 14 year olds, and for young black men, the lifetime likelihood that at some point they'll go to prison in their lives is one in three. That's double the risk as for Hispanic men and triple the risk, I'm sorry, six times the risk as for whites. Um, there are similar racial disparities for young women as well in terms of their like, lifetime likelihood, but women uh, are far less li likely than men to be incarcerated. So what are the roots of this disparity? Um, I think it's important to begin with this foundational agreement that the roots are not are, are two things, both disparities in criminal offending and disparities in crime policy. And so I have two charts here illustrating both of these points, and these are the extremes of what we would of crime that's going through our justice system. So on the left you can see the rate of homicide victimization by race. And you can see that African Americans recently and historically have been much more likely to be victims of homicide than whites. Um, so this, this is largely, a trip, and so because homicide is largely an intra-racial crime, that means the uh, likelihood of homicide offending is higher for African Americans than for whites. And this is largely attributable to the fact that people of color are more likely to live in concentrated urban poverty. Anybody who lived in those, lives in those kinds of conditions is more likely to commit serious violent crime. On the right hand side is the opposite end of the spectrum and here you can see marijuana usage compared to marijuana arrest rates, marijuana possession arrest rates and this is based on analysis by the ACLU. So surveys have shown that people regardless of race report using marijuana at similar rates. So it's almost a one to one um, uh, level of usage for whites and African Americans. And yet African Americans are three, over three and a half times as likely to be arrested for marijuana possession uh, compared to whites. So this is just an extreme example to show you. This is in terms of policing outcomes for the, what would potentially be considered the most minor criminal offense, but we can see unwarranted racial disparity. The disparity is not fueled by criminal behavior, but it's based on police decision making. And this we see echoed throughout the criminal justice system in the decision making of prosecutors, even in the decision making potentially of defense attorneys in terms of how they triage their work, in the decisions of judges, embedded also in our sentencing laws. So both of these factors are relevant when we think about what are the sources of racial disparities in the justice system and what do we consider to be unwarranted, as in not driven by criminal behavior, and what do we consider to be what some would describe as warranted, driven by criminal behavior, and with a, a source of disparity whose pro solution lies outside of the criminal justice system. So just a little bit to elaborate on what the sources of disparity from within the justice system are. Um, this is based on a report that we released last year at the Sentencing Project. The first one 
The first source is racial bias in the use of discretion. I think people are most familiar with this when they think about the source of racial disparity. So the decision that an individual officer makes about, for example, who to pull over, someone more, being more likely to pull over African Americans <coughs> than whites. So that's an example in bias um, exhibited in the use of dis officer discretion. Um, the next source would be uh, race-neutral policies that have a disparate racial impact. So the classic example here is the crack cocaine sentencing disparity um, and the fact that it, uh, it, it enhances sen pr prison sentences for African Americans who are more likely to be uh, uh, arrested and convicted of crack offenses. So the third source is policies and decisions that disadvantage low-income individuals. Uh, so because people of color are more likely to be low-income, when we have policies in place, for example, that require monetary bail uh, in order to be released pre-trial, that disproportionately impacts people of color and contributes to the worst outcomes that they experience in the justice system. <laughs> And then the last one is actually policies in the criminal justice policies that exacerbate um, socioeconomic inequalities. So the fact that when, we're, when the criminal justice system is done punishing somebody, that doesn't mean they're done being punished. So they continue to have a criminal record that affects their ability to get employment, um, to get housing, and so on. So how do risk assessment instruments help to address some of these problems? Well, what they do is they help to move away from discretion and move towards policies that we can interrogate and make sure are not reproducing unwarranted racial disparities. So this is a quote from Eric Holder from when he was Attorney General, and this is the praise that he had for evidence-based strategies which include, which he specified included risk assessment instruments in the federal system and he also in policing. So he said, that evidence-based strategies hold the potential to revolutionize community corrections and make our system far more effective than it is today by better matching services with needs, by providing early warnings whenever supervised individuals stray from their reentry plans, by incorporating faster responses from probation officers to get people back on track, and by yielding feedback and results in real time. So this is significant praise, and we see many examples where risk assessment instruments, if calibrated correctly, have the potential to reduce criminal justice contact for everybody and, and people of color and to reduce racial disparities. So an example of this, for example, is last year, New Jersey passed a law where it moved away from a uniform policy of require, requiring monetary bail for pretrial release towards using a risk assessment approach so that people who were deemed to be a low public safety risk and low flight risk would not be required to post monetary bail in order to be released. And so this is a kind of policy where it has, a, uh, has significant potential for taking people of color out of the justice system who, don't necessarily, who do not need to be there. So Eric Holder went on in his speech and talked about the concerns that he has about race, race, risk assessment instruments and the way that they can exacerbate uh, racial disparities. So he's, he in particular is concerned about risk assessment instruments in sentencing, but I think that the points that he raises are relevant in other stages as well. So he said, by basing sentencing decisions on static factors and immutable characteristics, like the defendant's education level, socioeconomic background, or neighborhood, they may exacerbate unwarranted and unjust disparities. Criminal sentences must be based on the following, he said. Fa the facts, the law, the, the actual crimes committed, the circumstances surrounding the individual case, and the, defend the defendant's history of criminal conduct. So I I've highlighted some of what I think is important here in that um, the static factors, I'll come, I'll talk a little bit more about this. These are, these are fa variables that he thinks uh, reproduce uh, unwarranted racial disparities in the justice system. Um, facts of the case, the law, these are appropriate variables to consider in sentencing. And in his list also, the criminal history of the defendant is an appropriate factor to consider. But people don't agree about this. Um, so these are some law professors, Sonia Starr is at University of Michigan, Bernard Harcourt is at Columbia <laughs> University, and this is what they have to say about the issue of criminal history and other variables. So Sonia Starr says, she's written, sentencing, um, 
Sentencing based on socioeconomic status and gender is statistical discrimination and should be found unconstitutional. Sentencing based on criminal history and demographic characteristics is constitutionally permissible but morally troubling. And so then here's Bernard Harcourt elaborating on this point. He says, in the era of mass incarceration, prior criminal history has become a proxy for race. Okay. So what do we make of this? How do we reconcile these differing viewpoints about criminal history? I want to suggest that one way to reconcile this is to think about, again, this distinction between what you might consider warranted racial disparities in criminal justice decision making and outcomes and unwarranted. So to the extent that we're measuring uh, the most serious offenses where we know greater representation has to do, of people of color in the justice system has to do with greater rates of offending, then uh, that is potentially you know, not something, that is not necessarily an unwarranted racial disparity in the risk assessment instrument. To the extent that we're me measuring, especially well, this is relevant with less serious offenses, but it happens really throughout across the board, uh, we're, to the extent that we're measuring crime policy and the racial disparities cr created uh, by decision making in the criminal justice system, then that's an unwarranted source of racial disparity. And we don't want to reinforce that in risk assessment instruments. So before I move on, I just want to make one final point about this. So that we're, we're looking at this with respect to criminal history, but it's also relevant when we think about um, the question of validation of risk assessment instruments and when we think about recidivism. So when we, when we talk about somebody uh, going back into the community and, and being arrested or convicted or sent back to jail or prison again, what are we measuring? Are we measuring actual differences in behavior or are we measuring uh, differences in the level of surveillance in the communities that they're returning to, differences um, in their likelihood of being picked up for a crime that if they lived in a different neighborhood, if they were a different race, they wouldn't have been picked up for. So I think it's relevant on both ends when we think about this. So to sum up these variables that were just mentioned, um, so we have uh, you know, the facts of the case and the law, circumstances surrounding the case, these are factors that, as Eric Holder mentions, he believes are valid components of a risk assessment instruments. Next, we get into a little bit more cloudy area in terms of criminal history, demographic characteristics like gender and age. Um, difficult to reconcile incorporating these in risk assessment instruments, but at the same time, if we, it's, uh, uh, it's undeniable that there are differences in criminal offending by gender and age. Um, and then the final set of factors, static and immutable characteristics that are correlated with socioeconomic status and race. Um, so I want to stick with th this list here and talk about a couple of reforms around the country um, that have been made to risk, assess risk assessment instruments, but also to other kinds of formal uh, decision-making policies in order to address the sources of racial disparity created by each of these variables. So really none of them are immune to the problem of creating unwarranted racial disparities, and, and, they can, and all of this can be addressed if we just look at the factors closely that, it, that we're incorporating into our decision making. So the first one, the facts of the case and the law. So Kenneth Thompson, the district attorney in Brooklyn, made the announcement last year that his office would no longer prosecute uh, marijuana possession arrests. Um, and he explained that this was because he was doing this so that individuals, and especially young people of color, do not become unfairly burdened and stigmatized by, by involvement in the criminal justice system for low level offenses. So, recognizing the racial disparity that happens at the point of arrest, he decided to make an intervention so that he wouldn't just pass these disparities up upstream. Um, and of course, there are limitations in who, who uh, the, the district attorney's office would not prosecute, but it's, it's an important step. Um, case circumstances. Uh, so this is an, an example from Multnomah County, Oregon, um, decided to revise this risk assessment instrument in juvenile justice decision making uh, so that it would no longer look at gang affiliation as an important consideration and whether or not to confine youth. And this is because gang affiliation was found to um, not be a valid variable for measuring risk in part because youth were list listed 
as having gang affiliation simply based on where they lived. So again, this is a factor where you know it's a it's a characteristic where we think this is should be a relevant characteristic re related to whether we want to enhance penalties or not. But it's important to think about well, how is that um, how's that attribute determined? That is it is it being applied fairly? Um, the next one, criminal history, uh, going back to New York City, the Manhattan District Attorney, uh, Cyrus Vance, learned by cooperating with, uh, through a study that it engaged in with Vera Justice Institute, that the, the department's plea offer policy was based on criminal arrest history. Um, and that this was producing unwarranted racial disparities because of the greater likelihood of people of color to be arrested for crimes um, regardless of r rates of offending. And so the department is beginning to move away from looking at basing plea bargain offers on arrest, on arrest history and moving towards um, criminal conviction history, which itself has its problems, but less so than arrest history records. Um, and then just moving on to the last factor here, this, I have an example from Berks County, um, Pennsylvania, and they moved away from, uh, they moved towards increasing alternatives for youth confinement because they found that a lot of youth were uh, being revoked uh, on probation in part because they didn't have a safe home to return to. And so instead of making that a, re a requirement for the youth in order to be able to successfully complete, the, complete their probation, they created alternatives um, such as electronic monitoring and checking in and so on. So these are just a couple of examples of jurisdictions that have um, you know, looked carefully at the variables that they're using in their decision making and uh, in order to find what are the unwarranted sources of racial disparities and revise them. So I wanna wrap up uh, by talking about uh, the, when we talk about reducing racial disparity, you know, reducing the impact of race um, and criminal justice outcomes, uh, uh, the focus rightly should be often on racial disparities. But race, just looking at racial disparities is not enough. We also need to think about the overall level of contact. Um, so, here, so just to kind of illustrate what I mean, the, um, the juvenile justice system has reduced levels of, of confinement um, by, f by half in the past 10 years, right? So that means uh, half as many youth are being detained and confined compared to 10 years ago now. Um, what they have not been able to achieve is to significantly reduce racial disparities in the rates at which youth are detained. Um, so that's important and that needs to be addressed, but we need to also acknowledge that fewer youth are coming into contact with the system, um, youth of color and whites are coming into contact with the system in the first place, and that is an achievement. And so we need to think about how to, uh, how to rep replicate that kind of success um, with risk assessment instruments, and so I'm gonna explain what I mean by that. So we often think about the current and uh, recent era that we've been in as one of mass incarceration that we're slowly working our way out of. But we're not just in an era of mass incarceration, we're also in an era of mass probation, of mass community supervision. And so we need to think about how to scale back. Um, you know, a lot of times community supervision is thought of as this ideal alternative to incarceration. But really it's, um, you know, we've cast a really wide net that we need to scale back. And so uh, just to illustrate this point, I'm gonna quote from uh, Vincent Schiraldi and Michael Jacobson. They were former probation um, department commissioners in New York City, and they wrote about the reforms that they implemented in that office, and, um, and in particular, the ways that they've used risk assessment instruments. And, and, and when they realized that they needed to not use risk assessment instruments, so they wrote, throughout the country, probation office officials are utilizing increasingly sophisticated tools to assess and address the risk that America's four million probationers pose to public safety. What may be surprising to some is that applying the same programs to low-risk people on probation actually increases their reoffending and can serve as a tripwire to unnecessarily revoke and incarcerate. Okay? So the point that I'm, I think that, that they're trying to make and I want to try to highlight here 
is that the criminal justice system, as we refine its and improve its tools, um, has a lot to offer, but it doesn't offer the tool for every problem. And so sometimes the best thing that we need to, we can do is to put the tool back, the tools back into the toolbox. We don't need to ha have an intervention for everybody that's brought into the system, especially because too many people are brought into the system and kept there for too long. Um, so I'll wrap up there. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, now Dr. Demaray will speak for a while and give you some additional information. Oh. There we go. All right, so I am going to um, now dig us way down in the weeds. And so I'm going to talk um, about those risk assessment tools that we've just touched on. Um, I think the reality that we have to reflect on here is that there is a huge rise in the use of risk assessment in correctional settings in the United States. In my um, sort of ardent perspective on that is that this is a good thing. I want to be clear that risk assessment tools were developed with the original intent of redu uh, reducing biased decision making. So our whole intent with starting in this process more than 30, 40 years ago was that we recognized that individuals were making biased decisions that weren't reflecting the, fa the facts of the case. So um, a few years ago now, um, I was asked with my colleague Jay Singh to um, do a review of what was going on out there in the US um, correctional system and to speak to what we knew about the validity of the tools that were being used um, in US correctional settings. So as a beginning of this process, we, l we tried to find out, well, what's being used? This turned out to be a much more difficult process than we anticipated. And we were able to narrow it down to about 60 tools that were used with more or less regularity or that we um, sort of as experts in risk assessment would say, well, that is actually a tool that I'm going to be willing to consider. Um, so of those, there were about 20 that were what I would say broad in, in scope, meaning that they weren't developed for an individual organization or an individual setting. Um, and then 40 that were then either modifications of those broad-based tools or tools that were um, developed and homegrown. So of those 20 tools, they fall into um, these categories um, of uh, families of instruments. I'm not going to spend much time going through the results here. I've spoken on this several times at these conferences in the past. Um, and as David said, your, the report in its um, full form is available on the Council of State Governments website. Um, but I did want to start thinking about what, what do these tools do in terms of <clears throat> contributing to or taking away from potential racial, racial bias. So um, as you might expect, myself and my colleagues who do research and training and consultation of the, in the area of risk assessment um, took to this speech by Eric Holder with fascination and fear. So <laughs> um, we have all glommed on to this speech. And I'm not going to reiterate um, what uh, Nazgal already went through. But uh, suffice it to say that there were some issues that were brought to the forefront in terms of what do we think about um, in terms of valid and perhaps ethical or morally acceptable um, items to consider in this <coughs> assessment. One thing that I'd also want to point out is that there is no instrument that fell into any of my research, and frankly of which I'm aware, that actually includes race as a risk factor. So let's be very clear. So what we're then concerned now are these categories of, in, of items that have been reflected on by Eric Holder, and particularly these um, issues of static factors. So. Um, as part of this project, I had gone through and really categorized um, what, ca what types of items were showing up in these instruments. Um, and I don't believe anybody will be surprised that every one of these 20 instruments that we identified had static risk factors as a foundation of their assessment. A few things on this point. Um, static risk factors are incredibly robust predictors of outcome. So whether it's criminal, offending we're interested, or any other behavior, static risk factors are very robust indicators. Um, so that's important. The other thing that's here, though, is that we're starting to see a lot more of these instruments not relying solely on static risk factors. And in fact, when my phone rings and people ask me what I think you should be using as an instrument, I go to the instruments that incorporate the static as a foundation or a backbone, but then the dynamic factors, meaning those factors that offer opportunity for change. 
Okay, so that's one point that I want to make is that there are instruments out there that do include in that far let me think, right column, um, a lot of factors that allow us to have extra considerations beyond what we would be concerned as immutable characteristics. I would say that the vast majority of my colleagues, um, and I also agree with Eric Holder in the sense that we don't believe that the foundation or the sole um, information in a risk assessment should be derived from immutable characteristics. So the second um, point that I'm going to bring up here is about this notion as um, criminal history um, as a proxy for race. And so again, this is a quote you've seen already this morning, so I'm not going to read it to you again, but the question remains, what is the extent to which that we're using prior criminal history in these risk assessments? Well, um, all of those instruments that we had um, included in our review also included criminal history as one of the foundational items of this assessment, or one, at least one of the items of this assessment. So a, a few points here from the research land. Um, this is a problem for us to wrap our heads around because criminal history is also the ro most robust predictor of future behavior. So that old quote, you know, past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior, statistically, this is true. So when we're talking about putting together an evidence-based, statistically supported instrument, what do we do with that? Do we say we're going to pull that out and not make any use of it when we know that that's going to account for so much of the variance in future behavior? It's a thought problem, um, and I don't have the answer to it. The other thing that I do want to point out is that most of these instruments include a wide variety of other factors that, again, will help inform our assessment. I'm not going to get into it too much, but there is also some different strategies that these instruments use in terms of informing um, estimates of risk. So it's not the case that every single one of these instruments or of the instruments that are out there simply uses an algorithmic approach. In fact, even those instruments that do use an algorithmic approach, meaning that there's some you know, mechanical process through which the computer spits out a statistical probability of risk, even those instruments have the opportunity for what a lot of us call clinical overrides. Um, so it's not necessarily a clinician, but whoever is completing the risk assessment in a lot of these instruments has the opportunity to say, yes, this is the statistical probability that was computed, but with my information about the case, I can make a different decision about what that level of risk actually is. And so I think that's an important issue to think about as we move forward in terms of implementation. One of the things that we see a lot in implementation is that there's um, uh, a, a discouragement, perhaps, of the use of those, um, or concerns on the use of the assessor that they're going to be questioned and that's a potential source of liability. From my perspective, those folks probably know a whole lot more than our instruments ever will, and so I'm a huge proponent of this opportunity to contextualize the information that goes into the risk assessment. Right, so if we're concerned in a particular case that this criminal history item is in fact acting as a proxy for race, this is where the assessor would be able to have that opportunity to say, yes, but, okay? So what did we find in terms of um, the research findings on the validity of the instruments being used? I I'm only going to touch on the issues related to race and ethnicity here. First of all, it, they weren't reported in all of the studies. So offender um, sample characteristics simply were not reported. I think this is a, re a reflection of the fact that our data went back to the 1970s and that this was just not standard practice. So what we see is that the vast majority, though, two-thirds um, of the offenders upon which these instruments are validated are white offenders. So. We tried to and wanted to um, report on the predictive validity of instruments being used in the United States in correctional settings as a function of the race ethnicity of the offenders. And quite frankly, we couldn't. So of the um, approximately, I think, 75 articles that, and studies that we identified, only three of those disaggregated predictive validity findings by race. I want to be clear that I don't think that this is an intentional um, misrepresentation of information. I think in many circumstances it's a question that's only recently come to the forefront in this field of research, um, for better or for worse. 
Um, and also, in a lot of cases, we don't have the samples that would allow us to disaggregate those findings. So we simply don't have the numbers that would allow us to conduct statistical evaluation um, of those findings. The studies that did report on them, one was on the COMPASS instrument, which is very widely known. Um, and in this particular research study, um, they reported identical rates of predictive validity, meaning that the predictive validity that they found with white offenders and black offenders um, literally was the exact same um, effect size. Two studies on the um, level of service inventory revised um, reported on um, predictive validity. And here we saw nearly identical but slightly worse predictive validity um, for our uh, minority or non-white offenders. I want to be clear, though, that this was not statistically uh, different. So when I say nearly identical, effect size differences were um, 0.73 for white offenders and 0.71. And so if you think about that loosely as 73% accuracy and loosely as 71% accuracy, as a researcher, that is not actually a statistical significant um, difference. It could be, however, a meaningful difference. More recently, um, resulting, I would say, almost definitely from Eric Holder's speech, um, there was a meta-analysis of over 120 articles that looked at the level of service inventory instruments and found that, generally speaking, minority offenders received a higher score. Now, they didn't do any item-level analyses, but my suspicion is that we're looking at those factors that Nazgal highlighted earlier as contributing to these higher ratings. But also, we have to still consider that there is what we would say perhaps is warranted disparity in rates of um, future offending risk. We also saw here, again, slightly lower levels of predictive validity, but it was to the same degree that I reported on on the previous slide. So here, what do we make of that information when we're seeing statistically similar or identical rates of predictive validity? And that's what the most recent study that I'm going to talk about was trying to get at. And so this is quite literally less than a month old. Um, Jen Scheme and Chris Lowenkamp conducted a study of PCRA assessments completed on over um, 34,000, almost 35,000 federal offenders. And again, we're finding this um, difference in terms of the scores themselves. So we're seeing slightly higher um, risk scores for black offenders compared to white offenders, and they identified that as being attributable to the differences in the rates of criminal history. Um, but they found strong and very comparable predictive validity for black and white offenders. And so this is a very recent current sample, and it's quite frankly huge. So I can't speak to those things that are happening that are contributing to the criminal history differences. But we can say that in the instrument itself, and remember the instrument is only as good as the data coming in and the people using it, <coughs> but in the instrument there seem to be some evidence that these instruments are working the way that they were designed, as in they were designed to reduce bias <coughs> in decision making. The other thing that they tried to do, and um, it was more of a statistical analysis, um, I don't want to get into it too much, but what they looked at is whether or not, statistically speaking, um, criminal history was indeed acting as a proxy for race. And so for us, proxy for race means something very specific <laughs> in statistics. So this means for us that, in, in essence, the race variable and the criminal history variable are predicting outcome in the same way, okay? And that is not what they found. So instead what they found is that criminal history explained, so statistically mediated the relationship between race and recidivism. So again, it's not saying that there is not bias that's going into this criminal history variable, but in terms of proxy as a word to be used, it doesn't appear that this is what's going on, at least from a statistical point of view. So what do we do with this information? Um, first of all, I think the biggest thing that we have to look at here is that are few, almost no, studies conducted particularly in the United States. One thing that I would say is that the vast majority of the research has actually been conducted outside of the US. And that's true of predictive validity generally, not just research on race and predictive validity. So we 
tried to focus on what we knew here, but that's not to say that what we know in other countries isn't also relevant. There is some evidence um, supporting from those studies that did uh, disaggregate by race um, that these tools appear to have predictive validity for um, offenders uh, that are non-white. And if you go to the larger literature, like in Canada and the United Kingdom as well, we do see differences again, as we did here, in terms of slight sort of incremental differences in predictive validity, but not in a way that we would say is statistically different. Again, though, what is that meaning, or what does that mean for us in terms of practical significance? Um, in the US, I would say there is actually some support based on these four studies that we were able to look at um, with respect to compass assessments, the level of service inventory um, instruments, and uh, the post-conviction risk assessment. Now, to be clear, though, <laughs> this is a very small research base. And I think my biggest take home message moving forward here is that we have to do research on this issue. And with that, I will hand it back over for some discussion, I think. Okay. Well, th first of all, thank you both very much. Uh, I have no doubt that this has created a number of questions in, in folks' minds. Uh, I have some questions to ask the panel, but I thought that first I would give the audience an opportunity if they had some questions that resulted from this conversation. And uh, we have a, a young woman here with a mic to bring to you so that everyone can hear. Thank you. Uh, thank you both, all. Um, Dr. Demery, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering, with respect to the instruments that do have a strong predictive um, validity, I'm wondering if that's just a, s a response to the fact that we also have um, racial disparities in the arrest rates and in, in incarceration. So it's predictive because of the, the bias in the system already. It's absolutely possible. Um, I think one of the things that's challenging about this is if we don't use that definition of recidivism, what do we use? And I have some thoughts on that, but I'll also tell you why these are challenges. So. Um, I've actually had quite a few discussions over my career, but also recently about how do we measure recidivism and how do we me measure reoffending. So we have some options. We can look at arrest rates. We can look at um, charges. We could look at convictions. Um, we could look at incarceration. And so I think our first speaker really, Nesgal, talked a lot about where there's potential for disparity in all of those processes, right? And so in, in fact, those are processes. So. Um, that's not something that as a researcher, when I get official records that I can do anything about, I have to say these are the records that came from the agency and they're as good as we're gonna get. Um, other strategies that we use in smaller studies is to also ask for um, the offenders to self-report. And I think this is a very underutilized strategy and um, people often cite concerns that they're just gonna to lie to us, but in fact, they're usually way more honest than I would expect. However, here's the issue with that. Um, those offenders that we're most likely to retain in research studies are those who are least likely to reoffend. So those folks that we probably care about the most are typically not the ones we're gonna be able to follow up for six months, let alone three years or 15 years for these research evaluations. And it's also just a, a practical issue. Um, in the Gen Scheme and Chris Lowen camp study, well, there's no way they would have done interviews with 35,000 offenders across the United States. So I don't have an answer. It's a, a reality of the issue of studying how these instruments work. So uh, kind of pushing a little bit more on that, I think that obviously, you know, you do the risk needs assessment um, uh, and the whole idea is that then hopefully use those dynamic factors to do interventions. And so the question here for me would be, uh, I think that the, the, the last uh, person kind of set the question up well by saying, hey, are these tools just kind of predictive of what society is already doing? Um, and so then the question for me is, what about the interventions then, right, that we're doing? Are, are those actually, um, you know, based on race? Are those as effective uh, across uh, the, the, the different uh, groups? Well, you know, I don't do as much intervention research. So, 
you know, my default answer is going to be I don't know as much. And I think, frankly, the reality is we don't have as much information, just like with the um, risk assessment research. What I would say that I don't think has been pointed out sufficiently is that, at least in my intent, a lot of these instruments are designed to identify those folks that we don't need to do anything with. And so one of the things that we haven't touched on here is that really the intention of these instruments is to identify those at the highest risk of reoffending for intervention, for incarceration, for whatever you know, level of criminal justice intervention and treatment is needed. But those folks at low risk, those folks at even at moderate risk, it does not mean that we're going to be intervening at the same level. So I think there's a disconnect often in the implementation of risk assessment instruments without also an understanding of what we know to be the risk need responsivity model, meaning that the first point of this whole enterprise is to identify those that we actually need to do something with. Um, and I don't think that that happens as often as it should in practice. I did actually take a look recently at some of the literature on whether they've disaggregate in terms of the treatment programs, because there are a number of treatment programs that have indeed shown a reduction when you're treating folks with you know, moderate or high risk of recidivism. And the reality of it is, is that when you look at that literature, that's not disaggregated by race either. So you see the reduction, but you don't know where that reduction, you know, if that reduction is for all Caucasian folks, if that reduction is across the board. It is clearly another area of study that needs and, to be taken up. And the reason I, I pose the question, because if we're saying there's something in society that's having minorities kind of go to jail more, if these treatment programs aren't addressing that, then, then you know, how does that kind of play itself sure. out? So That actually leads to a question I wanted to ask you all, which was, so let's just say for, you know, fun's sake, that <laughs> in, next month when you're not doing very much, you actually create the perfect risk assessment tool that resolves all these problems. Mm -hmm. And one of our friends creates the perfect treatment program that, you know, is, is appropriate, hits folks in the right way, hits everybody lower equally, et cetera. That would be wonderful, I think we would agree. But would that actually solve all of our difficulties in terms of criminal justice, in the criminal justice system, in terms of racial disparity? What are some of the other things that we have to think about? In other words, what can even perf perfect risk assessment not do? Um, I, I have one thought, and I'm going to pass it over to you. But um, one of the things that I didn't touch on, um, but that I try to incorporate in every, <laughs> every talk about risk assessment I, ha I give, is this notion of fidelity. So the tool is only as good as it is in its implementation. And so one of the things that I wonder about is evaluating this perfect instrument that I'm about to develop um, and making sure that people in the community and in correctional settings are using it in the way that it's intended to be used and with fidelity to the definitions that have been operationalized in the assessment manuals. And so where I think we're getting, even with um, really good risk assessment instruments, where we're getting some um, disparity reflects um, bias that's creeping in. So these were designed to keep bias out, but without good adherence and fidelity to the model, we're still going to have some, some room for bias to creep into the assessment process anyway. Um, this is a, it's interesting to think about this dream world scenario. <laughs> um, but I guess uh, for me, you know, even with the ideal risk assessment instrument, there's still the problem of uh, separating pr the provision of services from surveillance and so from supervision and um, so if we were you know I would like to see that as, as part of it as well because to the extent that the two are always coming together uh, that's that's problematic and and the way that the services are received is quite different than if it were coming without that supervision component and um, and then I guess there's also just the trickiness of the clinical overrides that Sarah was talking about um, in terms of the possibilities of bias being introduced there, but at the same, but also the sort of balancing the worry about bias, but also the worry that um, that criminal justice professionals are going to be deterred from using their discretion as much as they should. And so we see this with like with federal sentencing guidelines that are now advisory and not mandatory and the great reluctance of judges to move away from 
the advisory guidelines to actually to, to provide more customized sentences. So um, I think there's the ongoing challenge of how to balance um, appropriate gut instinct, well-trained gut instinct about uh, what should happen with these kinds of validated, um, um, systematized ways of decision making. I just had a follow-up question to that. Um, I'm a program analyst and I work with 10 different reentry programs in New York. Um, but my question was, how do I support the direct service staff when they're administering this compass result? Because they're administering the result, they're recording it within the case records, but I really don't think that they're actually using it, what it's designed for. And I don't know, if, is there something that I can do or if you had any suggestions, like how I can support them in doing so? That's a great question, <laughs> um, and I wish I had one answer for you. Um, I think a lot of it goes into how um, the tool is and the assessment is being framed to the frontline staff, and also, so I think there's a bottom-up and a top-down approach. I think that there needs to be some top-down um, policy making that says, um, more or less, thou shalt <laughs> incorporate this information, but then also, how do you make sure they're doing that? Um, so how do you do some sort of supervision, um, uh, review of records and of treatment planning? How do you integrate it into the fabric of what they're doing and supposed to be doing? But I think there's also this issue of working with the frontline providers to um, help them understand or maybe see where they feel like their assessment information informs what they're doing and helps them rather than acts as a barrier or acts as one extra thing to do. Um, so there, there's many different strategies that might be done there, um, but that buy-in from the front line, for me, I think is one of the only ways that risk assessment is going to achieve the goals that it was really designed to achieve. And then this gentleman in front. Uh, it's been very next. patient. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm wondering about the various elements of the risk assessment in terms of you commented on the static, the dynamic, but I'm very interested in the protective factors and resilience and being able to capture that and building off of strengths, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering in terms of that and then um, another question around um, again, in terms of predictive validity by race, it's very limited in terms of just the three instruments that have been, that have captured that. Would you have any recommendations for jurisdictions that are looking at using, you know, risk assessment tools? Would you recommend um, any of those three tools or anything else? Should they have all of those four components? Should it have high predictive validity by race? What are some of your thoughts about that? Um, so I do that a lot, <laughs> your second question. So let me get to your first question. Um, in terms of protective factors, I um, really strongly believe that we need to have a mix of protective factors, risk factors, um, static factors, and dynamic factors. I think they serve different purposes and they're all incredibly important. The field is just now catching up to this idea that, hey, maybe we should look at something positive about these individuals. And that's not a reflection on risk assessment, only, but really the field um, uh, of psychology as a whole, you know, we're really good at pathologizing. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to get better at, at identifying strengths. Um, so, you know, my short answer is that I like the tools that have all of those. In terms of thinking through uh, what instrument I would recommend to an agent or to a jurisdiction or an agency, um, it's actually a, mu a much more complicated question. Um, and I think it depends on factors that go beyond the straight content of the instrument and the predictive validity. So yes, those two things I think are very important. Um, I joked with um, David earlier today, uh, my initial reaction is just use something and don't create your own, <laughs> you know? So come, partly because um, in the creation of, of their own tool, um, there's not often the follow-up to validate it. So, you know, if there is the opportunity to create the validation data, well, that's one thing. Um, so, of those that seem to have a sufficient research base, I think there are a handful. And there's other considerations, though. Some of these that have all of the different things that we'd want end up being incredibly long. 
And so do you have an hour to spend with each offender? Um, and, if, and if your staff don't, well then you don't want to use that tool. Um, cost, some of these are incredibly expensive. Um, and I often default to something that's in the public domain um, if there's sufficient evidence behind it because then I know it's sustainable. Um, so there's a, a lot more complicated um, kind of considerations, uh, also considering the training and, and information resources. So some of these instruments dictate that it must be a master's level clinician completing it. Well, is that a reality for your setting? I, anyway, so it's a, a long way to say I don't have an answer um, that goes across all agencies. We have time for just one last question, and this gentleman has been waiting patiently. It's probably not so much a question as more of a, a comment, and going back to um, the, the previous question, um, you know, and I think your research is very interesting and it's great, but I think it's actually going to get stronger as I think one of the things that's been um, a weakness for the assessments has been fidelity. Um, and so I'm, I'm Multnomah County, Oreg uh, in Portland, Oregon, and Oregon has been working really hard about, we use the LSCMI. Mm -hmm. Last couple of years, we've done a statewide inter-rater reliability, um, you know, that included over 500 staff in the prisons and community correction staff. And, and what you're seeing is people are improving. The other one is in the past, because we've been using that assessment for over 10 years, but in the past, we had a lot of officers that did it because they were supposed to do it um, and then supervised the way they were going to supervise. So, so some of those, and they didn't case plan. I mean, we're, so in many ways, it's the last few years that the assessment and case planning and all of that, the fidelity is coming in now. And I hate to say this because I'm an older person, but it's the, the new younger staff that are actually being, as they come in, they're learning it, and this is the way they're going to do it. So I think you're opportunities for research around this will get much richer in the next five, ten years. Yes. Thanks for that. And just, I just uh, want to thank you all for coming to this fantastic session. I said to David, of course I'm coming to this one. This is, this is um, a topic of great interest. My name is Julie James with the Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance, and this is something that we're thinking about constantly. Obviously the Holder um, statement is something that we uh, want to be responsive to as well. Um, and I just wanted to let you all know that um, a, uh, in this past year we funded, <clears throat> excuse me, the Urban Institute to develop a risk assessment clearinghouse. Um, and I think that'll be a, a great resource for the field, for your colleagues um, to come and just um, basic information, also some more technical information, um, some comparative information like the kind that Sarah um, described that might be relevant for sort of selection or evaluating what, what's t what tools to use. Um, we're not interested in, in putting a thumb on the scale or rating the instruments um, because that's not our role. You, you know, you all can make those decisions for yourselves, but wanted to create a credible and neutral resource for the field um, that collects a lot of this information in one place. And obviously, um, Dr. Demaray's paper is going to be one of the first resources that we put up there. Um, and I was glad to hear about um, Dr. Gandush's, um contributions as well, the sentencing project report. I'm going to be looking that up right away and reading it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And thank everybody for attending. And please join me in thanking our guests. <laughs>